This conference will now be recorded. So good evening, uh, gents, and good evening, everybody out there. It's uh, July the 3rd, and um, we are about to start a high-risk recurrent advanced prostate cancer group. Um, as always, thanks to our sponsors, who are uh, Bayer, Pfizer, Janssen, Foundation Medicine, um, Myriad, Telix, uh, Blue Earth. Um, I should write them down. I think I might have forgotten somebody. If I forgot somebody, I apologize. <laughs> but uh, and that's I think I think that's that that's most everybody. Um, so uh, no new people. Um, we will launch right in with Frank Fabish. I have um, adjusted well to the metformin for my diabetes med as opposed to glimepiride. Had a few issues early on, stomach issues, but it's leveled out. And I've actually seen my diabetes readings start to go down uh, without a change in diet or anything else. So I'm pleased with that. I'll be talking to my diabetes uh, pharmacist on um, Wednesday, and uh, she'll expect a, uh, uh, new, the news on my adjustment to metformin. I'm set for my three month follow up with my uh, oncologist. I have to have a CT scan of the chest on um, July the 25th. They're checking the new nodule that appeared in my lung, the last uh, scan. And that was the one that was on the edge of the lung and into the pleura and my doc felt that it uh, it wasn't cancer, but he wanted to do a check on it this time. So I'll be getting that a week ahead of my uh, August the 1st appointment with my oncologist and blood draw. But everything else is fine and I'm looking forward to uh, to good results at the end of the month. And so are we. So here's a question. Did you plunge right into metformin at a thousand um, milligrams or did you go 500 and then step up? I'm still at 500 and I'm going to be talking to my pharmacist and we'll talk about that uh, uh, when, uh, when I speak to her in two days. Um, and um, and I, and you said you are seeing an improvement in your A1C or your glucose? Well, not the A1C. I haven't had a blood draw yet, but I've been seeing improvements. Uh, they have me tracking my diabetes readings uh, two times a day and switching from breakfast to lunch to dinner before and after. So I've been on that uh, tracking for the last two and a half years. And I've seen a change in my readings, uh, reduced readings on the top level uh, after, after meals. Okay. And, now and, the, and the only thing that's changed is the uh, metformin in place of the glimepiride. So I just wonder, and I and I I ask this question really for all of you gents who um, are dealing with both diabetes and were dealing with and were diabetic and then go on hormone therapy. If they adjust your diabetes numbers for the um, for the um, impact of the of the hormone therapy because we know that the hormone therapy is going to 
is going to have some impact and it's going to raise your sugar. And I just wonder, is that taken into account? I, I don't know. Anybody know? Any Anybody yeah. have any input on that? Yeah, uh, this is John Kish. I was on once and my blood sugar went up to 581 and I had to go to the emergency room. So it really, I was never on insulin until then. So it really raised my blood sugar, you know. Right. So I'm on seven different medicines for blood sugar now. So Lupron was like a Frankenstein for me. Yeah, medicine. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I just. I mean, I know even my own blood sugar got high when I was on when I was on Lupron for three years, and um, it just seems like um, the, the 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 endocrinologist should factor that in for guys that are on uh, longer term hormone therapy. But John, I know you, mine, I know mine takes that into consideration. My target for A1C is 7.5. And my yeah, last um, reading, my last reading before I changed from glimipiride to metformin was 7.8. Right. And and was was that target 7.5 before you started uh, on hormone therapy or not? No, they adjusted it from 7 to 7.5. Okay. Uh, when, uh, as I was going through that process. Okay. How about you, Dr. John? I started out uh, with a normal blood glucose history uh, and my uh, A1Cs sailed into the sixes when I was uh, put on Lupron. Then I was put on 500 milligrams metformin, got back down to the very high fives with just that mm -hmm. dose never increased after that mm -hmm. and uh, yeah they probably um, they probably would be good for them to put an extra a1c in there if anybody is starting lupron or for us to ask for it at the time especially if your control is not very good you know the lucky thing is that there's good blood tests available that can tell you how your a how your diabetes has been doing for the last few months so you don't really have to have a lot of guesswork about doses yeah. frank are you uh, are those all finger sticks those all those blood tests you're talking about yes oh okay yeah they're two they're two a day yeah and uh it, it's it's manageable it's not a it hasn't been a problem for me yeah, it um, seems like you tolerate it fine. You never get tempted to get one of those fancy schmancy devices implanted yeah. on your skin, do you? Uh, yeah. I've, uh, I've looked at it, but I haven't. I, I haven't gone to that yet. Yeah. Uh, and, so I had a, John. Oh, sorry. Uh, John, I was just going to ask Frank one quick question, and and then oh, over yeah. to you, Frank. I've heard us no call your last name Fabish and Fabish. Fabish. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, John. Okay, I'll correct. Go yeah, ahead, no. John, and, th and then Larry Fish. I, I got you, Larry. Go uh, ahead, John. Uh, yeah, the freestyle Libre is not accurate when it goes low. It was saying my blood sugar was 60, and then I went to McDonald's and drank like two orange juices and ate a Big Mac, and it still said it was low, and then I had them call the ambulance, and it was like 380, so... Huh. Um, they're not, they're at least three style libraries aren't totally accurate, at least with the low numbers. Yeah. So I, uh, I buy the contour next on my own because for mm -hmm. me that seems more accurate. And then a couple of times when I'm sleeping, I pulled off the patch for the three style libre. So, um, they're not perfect. And then I once I they tell me how to set it, once it hits 300, it beats like crazy. It used to be 200. So. Um, I don't know. I'd rather do the finger stick way, believe it or not. But they talked me into going back on the leave race, you know. So, um, yeah. So it messed up my A1C. I'm down to 7.1, but um, I don't know. Most of my doctors don't know anything about Lupron Depot, unfortunately. <laughs> so um, 
I mean, mm. I mean, I feel like even my cancer doctor doesn't really know. So, I'm trying to get a new doctor. Yeah. Okay, that's it then. But I'm on six or seven different things for blood sugar, and before that, I was just on metformin after the Lupron. So, um, I don't know. It, for me, it kind of doesn't fit the principle to do no harm. I mean, I'm off Lupron for six months, and my blood sugar is a little better, but it, it really destroyed my life, the loop time, but my doctor didn't seem to care, so I don't know. I guess he has too many patients, so um, that's it, Dan. Thank, thanks, John. Um, Larry Fish. Hey, hi, guys. Uh, so I'm really the candidate. Uh, when I got diagnosed, I was also overweight. Uh, I have obesity and uh, cancer, I mean, prostate advanced as uh, two competing problems. And when I went on Lupron, I went, I was pre-diabetic and I went fully into diabetic and went as high as a uh, 8.1. Um, so an endocrinologist, I've been pushing my other docs, but I've got on one of these diabetes drugs, one of the new diabetes drugs that also loses weight. I'm on Manjuro, but it's like that popular drug was Empic. Uh, I couldn't, I had to see the endocrinologist to get it. Uh, I went from 8.1 to 7.1 in just a couple of months wow. and i um, targeted to go to 6.5 right now. And if I lose a lot of weight, what happened in my past was I went into diabetes and I lost weight. I went out of diabetes. I was right on that pre-diabetic, diabetic. So my recommendation is to see an endocrinologist uh, and look at that di the new diabetes medicine. It's also a weight loss medication. Uh, you don't have to lose weight on Manjuro or Ozempic. That's it. I'm very happy with the results. That sounds really good. And and Larry, did they did they adjust um, did they adjust uh, y your targets when they when they did or when, when when this happened? You know, I or... I wasn't seeing an endocrinologist initially. There were no mm -hmm. target adjustments. Just we were char Just uh, I had to actually push my oncologist to do A one Cs every three months. Um, but it was steadily, it was sort of like was trending up and up and up as I've been on loop right now, going on close to seven years. It's pretty torturous. Um, but this Manjuro really made me, I'm really excited. Uh, I feel better. And my A1C came down dramatically, and I think it's coming down more. So I said my suggestion is to get to an endocrinologist who understands these new diabetic uh, medications that also have weight loss as secondary. Some people seek that weight loss primary, but I saw sort of for diabetes and your insurance will cover it because it's for diabetes. That's great. That's great advice. And, and the name of that drug again? Well, the one that's popular is Ozempic. You see it on television all the time. Okay. And you... the, new, the newer one is Manjuro, which I love, I'm on now. I finally was able to get it. It's an injection. You have to take it once every week. Uh, it's a real injection. It's not like a pop, one of those things you go, bzz, bzz, bzz. you have to give yourself an injection or you can go to the doctor to get it. Um, it's Manjuro. It's, I think, M-O-U-N-J-A-R-O. Will you, will you put it in the chat window, Mr. Yeah, sure. Fish, for us? Sure. Okay, we'll put right them now. both in the chat window. All right. I mean, I I'm, don't know the other spelling, but it's the one on TV. That's okay. It's, it'll be close enough for government work. The guys will figure it out. Now, what the reason I, 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 I sort of push this a little bit is because we don't often talk about this interaction of um, diabetes and, 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 and the Lupron and, you know, we took, we've talked more often about other aspe aspects of metabolic syndrome, like blood pressure, for example. Um, so I just think it's worthwhile. So will does anyone else have anything they want to contribute to this this um, diabetes um, discussion? I got a quick comment. It's Jeff. I just, you know, I've been on 
Lupron for six years. Um, I've been taking my A1C for seven, and it's only been above 5.6 twice because I what I eat. Now I don't I don't think that's the whole thing, but I guess it doesn't get to everyone. I, other people here not have any problem at all with their A1C with taking Lupron. Uh, maybe it's just some people. Yeah, I never had a problem on Lupron with uh, A1C or or my glucose level never went over 100. So it's not everyone. I think you have to I think you have to be either pre-diabetic or diabetic um, to increase your risk. Well, I was told I was pre-diabetic about seven or eight years ago, but an A1C wasn't above 5.6. The doctor said, oh, well, you're just going to be. Uh, it's just sort of weird. He based it on my uh, low blood, my blood sugar, but uh, never did an A1C until after he declared it. I am um, I'm pre-diabetic, and uh, lately they've been doing an A1C check for, on me, and um, I haven't had, I'm still pre-diabetic. I haven't changed very much from that, so I don't think it's the Lupron or anything. <clears throat> Well, the only thing I would say on that, Cliff, and I, I, I don't I hate to be the bearer of bad tidings, but it does take time. It's one of those, it, it sort of creeps up on you. So you, you start to see um, that that uh, glucose number, in my case, and I think this is true in most cases, you know, six to eight months after you've, how long have you been on the hormone therapy now? Um, since December of 21. Oh yeah, well, it, if if it was gonna happen, it should have happened. So you're yeah. good, yeah. and you know, I, I I'm sure the amount of exercise you do makes a significant difference. I, it's like it's got to help. I hope so. And, yeah, and my diet is uh, I'm a uh, pescatarian, so I eat a lot of vegetables and you know fish and some chicken, but that's about it. You so you you didn't you didn't have the hamburger then at the uh, on Friday. No, I didn't have the hamburger. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Yeah, well, cake. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. We'll keep we'll keep moving along. And um, but I, I I'm glad that we I'm glad that we hit this topic of diabetes. It, it it's good to air um, the subject every once in a while. Richard Crayman. What did you have on? What did you have on Friday? Uh, I hate to admit it, but I had a Reuben. <laughs> I can it looks so good, and it's been so many years. <laughs> Can't get much worse than that, can you? <laughs> no. I testify. I saw him eating it. I saw him enjoying it thoroughly. Uh, I did enjoy it. Good. Good, good. God bless you. What's on your mind? Did you have some? Did you? Did you? I I had a tick by you. Was there something you wanted to discuss today, or did I make a mistake? I think you. I don't have anything other than uh, we're now going to get off of uh, ADT. It looks like and go to possibly the Povenco. But so, we're in the process of going through all the tests right now. Okay, so 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 maybe maybe stopping um, going on a holiday for a while and 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 doing Provenge. I, I'm not quite sure what the uh, protocol is going to be. Mm -hmm. I just got that from uh, Alan and Markowski today. Okay, well. Keep us, keep us um, in the loop. And if you have any questions that you want that you want to ask these guys, then just raise it with us, please. I've been getting, uh, I've been listening for a long time on this progression. You're, you're, you're keeping it pretty steady, are you not? I mean, I know it's always hard. In, in your situation um, to 
to see exactly what's going on because your PSA isn't a good isn't a, a, as good an indicator, but the scans have been stable. I had a uh, CT scan and basically said the uh, nodules in the lungs are a little larger and the um, lymph nodes uh, uh, pelvis uh, have significantly grown and that's uh, last week. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so, you know, then, then the question is where to go with that. And, um, and so, I mean, I'd be surprised if they wanted to take you off the, the, the aberratorone, but I don't know. Well, that hasn't happened yet. Okay. It was just that uh, I need to, uh, uh, we're, we're going to start looking at these, including the uh, PSMA test, uh, scans. Okay. Uh, but uh, that's about uh, the limit. I've listened to what you're saying and uh, along there that uh, I need to, well, we'll find out what uh, the, the, uh, the test, testron uh, levels are. Um, that was a blood test today and the PSA. Uh, both of those have not come in yet. They usually come in uh, uh, the next morning. For some reason, they're slow. Um, do you, do you, have you had a, a PSMA test before? No. Okay. Because the thing that, that, that I wonder is, is whether this foamy gland, um, is PSMA avid or not. Did, did they say anything about whether you would, they expected you to be PSMA avid? Uh, no, not yet. I haven't had a chance to talk to, um, uh, the two of them, they, they got together uh, over the CT scan, and then uh, I just got a, um, we, I have talked with Dr. Allen about this in the past, that it was a possible um, path that uh, I'd be following, and after that, um, I have not really had a chance to talk to him. It was a quick message. To, uh, okay. arrange for the uh, test and I haven't had a chance to talk to the um, nurse who's supposed to be arranging it to, and that was uh, today. Okay. Anybody have anything they'd like to contribute or any advice for Richard in terms of talking with his doctors? Okay. Oh, good. Okay. Well, keep us posted, Mr. Yeah. C. I've got a, a, a friend who has uh, gone through this. He's gone to, he goes out to uh, UCSF, but he has had the scans several times. He's, uh, his prostatectomy was 12 years ago. And, he, you know, it's been one step after another, one surgery, one radiation, etc. So uh, he's also a source and uh, he recommends uh, UCSF. Matter of fact, I think he's out there right now. Yeah, well, I, I would say, I mean, obviously, I, I am a huge, huge fan and, 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 and um, uh, advocate for UCSF. But if I was in uh, Virginia, I would not be schlepping to the other side of the country. I think there are some places that are equally good um, that are closer. So that would be, that would be me personally. So, who, 
who uh, closer? Um, well, I what I don't you know I don't want to be talking about advice for somebody who isn't on the call, Richard. So I'd be happy to talk to him, or he should come on the call. But there are many many good places closer, and for you, as we, we you know. We, We've discussed. You know, you know, you know about Hopkins, and you you have uh, Makowski at, at Hopkins, and um, uh, Duke is really good as well. Um, in the immediate area to you, those are probably the the two best. Okay. Well, I've got uh, them uh, on my list. Hopkins, I have on my list already. Right. Well, because of uh, right. conversations I've had with Markowski up there. Exactly. So let, let's go step by step and see what they come up with. And if we need to navigate you for a second opinion, we, we can easily do that. Again, I, I, yeah. I think we let's right. move on. George, yeah. Let me just say one thing. Uh, I'll yes. get back to Richard about this if I find anything, but I just tried to look up about whether foamy gland cells were PSMA avid or not, and I couldn't come up with anything about it. Mm -hmm. But uh, if I find anything, I'll uh, I'll ask Rick for your email yeah. address, Richard, and send it to you. Okay. Yeah, the last, last um, uh, paper that I have uh, was one, uh, I don't have it handy, published in uh, late uh, 22 and uh, uh, who's the uh, God? I can't even remember his name now. Um, pathologist at the Hopkins, Jonathan Epstein. 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 Oh, yeah. He was one of the authors, and uh, Markowski wasn't, but uh, you know, they were they've have published papers together but um so anyway the point is um and there were only 24 patients uh, that they had to um right uh right. In i mean this is list. the issue is it's it's really rare so you know i don't know if we know i mean we're I don't know um, in, in since the PSMA technology has been readily available how many cases there have been, but we'll find out because that you know they're going to screen you and they're going to be as interested to find out as you are and as we are, I think, Richard. Oh yeah, uh, there's there's also another. You know, I didn't mean to really get into it. There's a. Uh, Dalutamide uh, with uh, chemo, as I'm, I've just found with uh, the Prostate Cancer Foundation uh, article, uh, as another um, path forward. Uh, but as it turns out, I haven't talked to either of my oncologists on it, so. I'm sorry, what path is that that you're referring to? Uh, the Prostate Cancer Foundation. I yes. What, what, what is the treatment they're recommending? They're not. It just uh, says FDA approves darlutamide with, uh, for metastatic uh, hormone sensitive prostate cancer. And then with, uh, in the article, it says go with... Uh, uh, yeah, but darolutamide was approved a long time ago. Yeah, two years ago but, or three years ago. Yeah, but then with uh, chemo, I don't know. That, I don't know anything more than I read uh, short, so I can't say okay. it's recommended or anything else. Okay. Well, if there was a recent, if there was a recent. Um, approval gents with uh for a different use of darolutamide let me um to do my brain's trust if you find anything recent on darolutamide um i don't know because i'm not 
really on top of what Rick, that, following. Rick, that was a, a new application for darolutamide. And I think it was, if I pronounce this right, Taxotere. That's a... Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so that's what they... Uh, that's what the study was. Um, but that's all I can tell you because I didn't read it. When when was this? When did you see this, Jerry? Oh, uh, within early last week, maybe a, a week ago. Okay. I well, saved we'll, we'll, it. Yeah, no, we'll, I'll, I'll look and we'll, we'll find it. But, you know, right now, darolutamide and chemo are, are, are being prescribed. So... I don't know quite what um, the, both that combination is, is is being used. My guess is that it might be um, a recommendation for um, metastatic hormone sem sensitive prostate cancer for people with high um, with high degree max. Yeah, that would be my guess, but we'll 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 look into it. We need to move along yeah. anyway, so. I went through so, the chemo. Got to move along. Got to move along. Sorry, think. Richard. Sorry. Um, Joe Blanchett. Yes, thank you. I've got two, uh, two things. Um, um, one is XGVA. Len has been mentioning that for the past couple of weeks, so I decided to research it today. And what I found is that uh, XGVA works to slow bone breakdown. It also works to keep bone tumors from growing. Should I be on next GMA? Because I have bone cancer, prostate, uh, prostate bone cancer. Uh, that's one question uh, for Len. Uh, can you add to that, Len? Uh, should you be on uh, XGVA if you have metastases to the bone? The answer is absolutely yes. Okay, because Dr. E has not been in favor of that so far, but I can ask her again. Yeah, ask her why not. Uh, yeah, and um, what, I mean, obviously you've read something about this recently. Uh, what's what's the research behind this? Well, uh, exgeva, there are two types of uh, bone cells, an osteoclast and an osteoblast. The osteoclast is the type of cell that breaks down bone, it makes it more porous, you, you know, osteoporosis. So it makes a more inviting environment for cancer to settle in and start growing. Uh, and exgeva uh, blocks the action of the osteoclast cells and it favors the osteoblast, which builds the bone up. So when you take exgeva, you're building up your bone strength and density. <clears throat> And, and, and you're making it uh, a less hospitable uh, uh, environment for cancer. A very good answer, I think. Okay, I understand. Uh, understand. Uh, understand. Uh, Joe, Joe, Joe hey. this, this, is, this is old research. I mean, Exgevo yeah. was first approved by the FDA, I'm guessing around 2014. 2013. That's just a guess, but somewhere it's been it's been a long time. Now, yeah. anybody, anybody, we're, we're, we're getting an awful lot of um, sound uh, feedback. Yeah, Joel, here. maybe you should lower your volume. Your volume is so high that your voice is a bit distorted, at least at my end. Yeah, and here too. Um, so, Joel, the um, the 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 wisdom has always been that if you have metastatic bone cancer, then or metastatic prostate cancer, and it's in the bone, then you should be taking a bone strengthener. Um, years ago, it was a bisphosphonate, and then. Um, Exgeva denosumab was um, introduced, and the choice ever since then has been either bisphosphonate, which would be something like Zometa, zoledronic acid, or Exgeva. And, and more and more we see Exgeva rather than Zometa. So um, 
it's pretty standard to be placed on um, a bone strengthener. Now, there are pros and cons of being on a bone strengthener. Yeah, I was going to doing... ask you what the side effects are. Right. So if the if the um, if you don't have a lot of um, metastasis and you're pretty stable, then the longer that you delay, probably the better off you are. The the bone strengtheners have a huge, huge half life, like two years or more, and they have disadvantages. So the first, and this is my understanding of this, and I would will be um, stand corrected by the doctors or the brains trust, but the first problem is that what these drugs do is they make your bones more denser. They make them more solid. They fill in the holes, which is what exactly what Lem was explaining between the blasts and the clasts. Um, but the disadvantage of that is they become more brittle. So you lose flexibility in your bones. And so whilst it makes it more difficult for the cancer to spread in the bones because the, because the, the bones are denser, it also makes you more susceptible to fracture. And um, because you don't have you don't have that give in your bones that you that you had before. Now that can lead to other problems. And the one that we talk about the most is osteonecrosis of the jaw, which ONJ, which most of you have heard about. Uh, Dr. Bob isn't on today, but he'd be happy, I'm sure, to talk to you about osteonecrosis of the jaw, which can be a very nasty condition and which why they say, Get all your dental work done before you start on a bone strengthener, whether it be Exgiva or whether whether it be um, some form of a zoledronic acid. Now, most of these drugs have got multiple, multiple names. Um, and they come in different strengths and a different strength has a different name. So Reclast, for example, is the same as Exgiva, except it's a six month shot instead of a four week shot. And um, uh, same thing with the zoledronic acid. And, and you can, t and most of these drugs come in pill form too. The problem when you take them in pill form is you have to take them, it's a bit like abiraterone, you've got to get up early, you've got to take it, you, 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 got to, you can't lie down for a certain period of time. They have issues with, um, um, with regurgitation and, and, and I, I, I don't know what. So they have pros and they have cons. And I think that if Dr. E um, hasn't put you on a bone strengthener, it's probably because she doesn't think it's warranted just yet. And she doesn't want to impose the side effects on you. So I would say, have a discussion with her. I, this is not one of those situations where I would go and say, I want to be on. It was, it's one of those situations where I would say, what do you think of, in my case, what are the pros and what are the cons? And that, that's how I would address it. Um, I've rambled on a bit. A anybody else want to talk about the pros and cons of, uh, of bone strengtheners? Only one thing. Yes. One thing only I want to say. I know it may seem off topic or it may not be available if not applicable, fine. But lifting weights is the bone strengthener whose only side effect is improving the longevity and quality of your life while it's doing it. Well, look, there's, there's no question. There's no question that that weight weight bearing exercises can help you immensely too. They did for me. I mean, I was on both a bone strengthener and um, and I did a bunch of weight resistance, and it helped me, and it it pulled me off of being osteoporotic. Um, but, um, so that goes without saying, I mean, it doesn't mean if you take a bone strengthener, you should stop doing the exercise. Who, who else wanted to, somebody else wanted to say something. Yes. I wanted to say something about that was an excellent description of how the bone strengthener pros and cons, Rick. And I'm not doing a bone strengthener, even though I have metastasis 
in uh, up some spots in my body because I'm very active. My bones, where they're not metastasizing, are very strong. I have great density. I was advised, offered it, but advised probably shouldn't do it. And my longtime dentist said, look, you've, you're have you unlike some people. You've got all four wisdom teeth. Now, they're not causing any problems, but as you get older, if you need to have something done in your jaw, it's just not going to happen. We'll never be able to get it to heal. So they thought zoledronic acid or exgiva, you don't real not really a candidate for it. And the whole thing about having the bones uh, re retain their elasticity, so to speak, if you're eating really well and you're uh, meeting the metastasis with a uh, good diet, the osteoplasts can get some work done to heal metastasized areas that mm -hmm. have been neutralized by the treatment. Now, I, I'm starting Taxotere next week, first time after six years. Hormone therapy has done its job. That's it. I don't have any other choice because of where my mets are, but I'm still not going to do the bone strengthener unless my oncologists say it will make a big difference in filling in the hollow spots like you were speaking about well i what what we we would definitely come back to you on on the chemo if we have time at the end rick but um I would say that that discussion about whether or not you should be on exchiever is a discussion you need to have with somebody like Agawal and not your local people, because it, it, you know, I think there's more complexity in there. And, and listen, they do understand it. They do get it because they prescribe it for other cancers. Like their knowledge is coming from breast cancer, I would guess, rather than from prostate cancer. But you, um, I, I, that's that's why we're so big on having a, G, a GU medical oncologist. And by the way, not only do we share an, an, a, a nickname, but we share four wisdom teeth. I don't think I've met anybody else who never got their wisdom teeth. Now I do. Oh my oh gosh! <laughs> so well, I've listen, got I'll tell you. I'll I'll go, I'll leave with this. I did find a GU. It's a woman. It's at Huntsman. She's okay, well, let, let, let's believe. come back to you. I don't want to. I don't want to hijack this thread. Okay. Okay. I don't want to hijack the thread. Um, we'll cut. We'll we'll try. I'm sure we can fit you in uh, at, at, at the end. Um, Jay, you wanted to say something. On, on I have one more question, Rick. Rick, I have one more question. Um, uh, I'll, 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 Joel, Joel, I'll come. Let, let's finish up with the exchiever, and then we'll come back. Okay. To you. I know. You Okay. Joel has a comment. Joel has a comment on the exchiever, and your sound is horrible today, Joel. I don't know what's going on, but it's awful. Go ahead, Jay. Comment on the uh, exchiever. Uh, the uh, question is: Is Alan Drani um, a bone strengthener? Is what? Is Alan Drani a bone strengthener? Yes, yes, alendronate, alendronate sodium. I, that's the one I take. It's alendronate, a, yes. It's a generic for Fosamax. Yes, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a generic for Fosamax, but, you know, uh, my feeling is that if you have, if you have metastatic um, cancer, then you shouldn't have to be bothering with Fosamax because it's a pain in the butt to take. And you you can go to your doctor and you can ask them for that same drug in um in in, in a in either reclast or exgiva and then you get a shot every either once a month or once every six weeks and and or, or you you get it um every six months and it's just just makes your life easier so speak to your GU medical oncologist or your medical oncologist and ask them if they can prescribe. The, the issue is this, it just came up with one of the guys we've been working with a long time in, in, in uh, California. If your GP 
or your PCP or your endocrinologist asks for a bone strengthener, they make you take Fosamax to begin with. They won't, the insurance won't prescribe. If the oncologist asks for it because they want it as a bone strengthener to help your, um, uh, your cancer, to, then you can get the more expensive shots right away. Okay. And that's why most of these guys who are in here are either getting Exchiva or um, uh, uh, Reclast. Reclast or or Zometa. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Joe, do you have another question? Yes. Uh, uh, TP53. Uh, I got from... Uh, uh, Dr. Pamela Munster briefing that um, people who have TP53 should Joe, be... can, can you turn your volume down a little bit? You're coming in so loud it's distorted. Okay, so, so the mic volume, I guess, that's the problem. Uh, yeah, the mic. Okay, can you hear me better now? It is better, yeah. Okay, I'm talking a little less loud. Um, Pamela Munster said um, that um, people with TP53 should be checked if they have pancre uh, pancreatic cancer be uh, at a quality institution like uh, City of Hope, Penn, Harvard, etc. Um, can anybody elaborate on that? Did they, is, that is that the way you guys understood it? I'm not sure what your question is. The question is, I have TP53. Should I be checking, a, a, getting a doctor check if I have p uh, symptoms of pancreatic cancer? I, I think that that was more, I think her comment was not around TP53. It was around BRCA. I think that what she said is that if you have BRCA1 or BRCA2, that um, you should be checked for pancreatic cancer. Somebody asked her and we, we, we even suggested where to go. Um, TP53, I think may be common in, or may occur with, with, with um, uh, in pancreatic, but it doesn't induce pancreatic. So in other words, we don't see people that have BRCA um, are at risk for pancreatic cancer. They're also at risk for melanoma and they're, they're at risk for prostate cancer and, uh, and for breast cancer and for ovarian cancer if they're a woman. If you have TP53, it's exhibited. It doesn't make you put you at risk for that cancer, as far as I know. Guys, uh, anybody, anybody want to uh, say anything? We've got David Muslin first, and then um, and then Len. Go ahead, David. So, the, so I'm on, I'm on Prolia, which I think is the same as Exgiva, correct? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I was so, just going to comment on that, uh, David, but but you go ahead. So one of one of the, and I, I'm just and I'm reading all about Prolia here while while we've been talking and and uh, I've been I've been having some bad breakouts of rashes and uh, of, of rashes and ex eczema, and I wonder if anybody else on the drug has has experienced the same. And hives, basically, really bad hives. Has anybody experienced that being on uh, Exiva or Prolia? Is my question. David, this is Gary. Um, I'm on Prolia. Um, I have not had uh, those symptoms. This is Les. I've been on Prolia for a long time too, and I have not either. Yeah, I think I um I I I I'm sorry. I was thinking um that that reclass was Prolia. Prolia is the is the um is the longer version of Exchiva. Reclast is um in the 
um, bisphosphonate family, as is Fosamax and Zomeda. So you've got Zomeda reclassed Fosamax over here, and then you've got Exgeva and um, um, uh, Prolia, and then there's a pill form of it too, whose name I can't remember. Thanks, um, Rick. Yeah. So I was just I was just wondering about the hives that I've been struggling with. They're better, but they're coming back again, and uh, they're itchy as hell. But I, I don't know if it's the cause of the, from the proleo or not. And it says it could be serious allergic reactions have happened with people who take proleo. So just curious if anybody else experienced. Thank you, Jen. Is that is that what it says in the in the proleo um, handout? Serious allergic yeah. reactions. Yep. You know, I I would say again, talk to your um, talk to your buddy the GP. Yeah, nobody nobody seems to know, but uh, I'll did you ask him? Day. Have you asked him specifically about Prolia? Because I'm sure he prescribes Prolia for osteoporosis. Sure, he does. You know, I will ask him directly. Um, yep. But he's pretty sharp, and he sees all the drugs on him. But maybe he missed it. And maybe maybe he's got somebody else. So, but yeah. I think it's important to be on it. But I would give it up because these. Uh, I, I maybe I should take a break from it and see if my if my hives go away. But I'll talk to him about it. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Len, did you did you yeah. want to say something? Oh. Yeah, so first, David, uh, are, are you taking any other meds that might be causing <clears throat> the rash? Um, good question, Len, as always. Um, I don't think so. Don't think okay. so. I mean, I'm just taking darolutamide and, uh, and I'm taking uh, Zyrtec and Claritin for these rashes. And I get, a, I get what's called a Zolair shot for these rashes. And it actually took it all away. But now it's starting to come back again. Not like it was, but I'm getting patches of it. Okay. Yeah, maybe you should try stopping Prolia, see what happens. But uh, so what, what I wanted to say oh, to Joe. Len, hold, hold, Len, hold on one second. Yeah, again, the problem with stopping Prolia is it's going to have a long half. So do a little. Yeah research into what that half-life is. It can take a long time to get out your system. What I would say, rather than just self-medicating like that, is talk to somebody like your GP buddy um, or an endocrinologist. Ask him to put you in touch with an endocrinologist or, or an allergist and, and, and dig into that, dig into it with the endocrinologist or the allergist as to the side effects it could be that's where it's coming from how long have you been on it david probably um three or four years three years yeah i mean you know it's it, you could easily i shouldn't say you could easily um because we can't give you that sort of medical advice but it's going to stay in your system for a long time so if you stopped it will stay in your system for a long time yeah and 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 you know find out and 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 you know maybe make a plan on that so if you went off of it it's not like you don't have the medicine you still have the medicine right right i'm gonna i'm gonna okay. ask uh, i've got a good allergist on board and he, who was recommended by uh my internist and i'm gonna send those guys a note and see how they respond okay let us know yeah we'll do thanks that, everybody that's how that's how we learn uh, Len, yep. you want to talk about the TP53? No. Um, <clears throat> as a midway path, middle path for Joel, he may want to talk to Dr. E about taking Prolia instead of Exgeva because it's the same drug, but Prolia is half the dose, and you only get a shot every six months instead of every three months. So, right. you know, I would definitely have that conversation. Also, Rick, the, uh, the bisphosphonates are much more long acting than uh, denosumab, which is okay. a generic name for both uh, Exgeva and Prolia. As a matter of fact, I read, I read an uh, article that proposed this protocol. If you're going to stop either Prolia or Exgeva, 
they say that within six months, all of the bone strengthening uh, after stopping could uh, could be lost. So apparently, it's a complete washout in six months. And they right. suggested that if you're going to stop Exgiva or Prolia, that you take a single dose of um, uh, Zometa to lock in the gains that you've made. And that'll last wow. for a couple of years. Yeah. Wow, so, that's interesting. Yeah. There you go, David. So, you you know, uh, the Zometa is very long lasting and the Exgiva is not so long lasting and you, you know, and maybe this combining the two. Did, didn't we also learn recently that there are risks in coming off the Exgiva? Yes. Yeah, the um, risks are, um, well, well the, one of the risks is what I just mentioned, that after a period of six months, uh, you know, the, the osteoclast action comes back strong mm -hmm. and it starts breaking down the bone. Mm -hmm. um, and as a result of that, you could be at increased risk for fractures. Okay. Okay. After stopping. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And uh, also to Joel, um, yes, osteonecrosis of the jaw is the most serious adverse effect of Exgiva. However, its incidence is less than 5%, one or 2% for the first couple of years, and then it goes up a little bit after that. And it's mostly, it mostly occurs in people with poor dental hygiene or who have had uh, bone invasive dental work, like pulling teeth or implants or things like that. Uh, but it's, uh, the incidence is far less, uh, you know, if you have good oral hygiene and you avoid certain types of dental procedures. Um, I remember is, uh, Dr. Bob saying that he, he's very rarely ever seen it. Right. Um, is the incidence of ONJ the same with, Zom with, with, with the zoledronic acid and the denosumab? I think it's about the same. Might be a little bit lower with Zometa. Okay. Okay. Um, anybody got any comments for Joel on this TP3, TP53 uh, inquiry and, and what Dr. Pamela said? All right, thank you. Go ahead, Joel. No, I was just saying thank you for uh, all the comments. Okay. Okay, um, if anybody finds that TP53 is causative with pancreatic cancer, for goodness sake, let me know. I don't think it is, but please let me know. Uh, David Muslim, what says, what was the name of the drug that Len just mentioned? Uh, Zometa. 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 I'll put it in the chat window. Zoledronic acid or, or Zometa. Thank you, Rick. That's, 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 what, um, that's what I got. I had three infusions of Zometa um, when they put me on hormone therapy and found out I was osteoporotic. Um, so Zometa. All right, I'm going to keep moving along. Jay, you had a question for us. Uh, yeah, I just... Uh... I'm experiencing, I think, what I would describe as a stress response where my shoulders are raised and my feel like my face is contracted like a, a fight or flight response. And I just wondered if anyone experienced anything like that. So, wait a minute. You're, is the, you, you're suddenly feeling like you're... you're sh your shoulders, say it again, your shoulders are contracted? Yeah, the, my, my shoulders are raised. Raised? Like, like uh, you know, I'm going to fight somebody. Yeah. Um, and 
And when does this happen? All the time? You're just like going around all the time like this? Yes, pretty much. Okay, Dr. John or Dr. Jack? I think this falls into <laughs> this. Guys, this has to fall into your bailiwick, one of you. <laughs> A little more specificity, not enough information. Um, I um, I was um, I had four injections of Degarolex and um, Extandi, and then recently I had one injection of Lupron. Um, uh, since I got my first injection of the Degarolix, I kind of felt like this, um, but it uh, seems like it's more prevalent now. Uh, the frequency is, is more prevalent. I'm aware of it. I try to lower my shoulders and then I come back and I think my shoulders are raised again. And um, I mean, I've got all of the other symptoms of, of uh, the deprivation therapy, but um, this is something I didn't read about. Any I'm thoughts? I'm waiting for the... I'm waiting for one of the doctors to respond. I mean, I, I, my, my gut feeling is that, um, you know, you, you, it's, it's causing some anxiety and this is, and this is a manifestation of the anxiety, but, uh, I'm not a doc and, you know, I, that's why I, I asked Dr. John or Dr. Jack if, 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 uh, because we, we often see, at the start of hormone therapy um, that people exhibit um, certain um, <clears throat> different, they experience differences in their mental health. That's not uncommon. Um, now, you know, manifesting in terms of shrugging, keeping your shoulders shrugged and, um, and other things, um, it ju just could be uh, some relaxation techniques, but I need some help here, guys. Yeah, Rick, uh, I've had, this is Jerry, and I've had <clears throat> that <clears throat> affliction, if you will say, for a long time. And it was because, uh, well, I think part of it was uh, most of the time I was driving, I was in my car. And in driving, I get tense and uptight. Uh, and so it was really bothering me. I'm going to uh, physical therapy right now because your major back muscle is three parts. And I can't tell you the names. But the upper part is the strongest muscle. And that's what you use <clears throat> when you put your shoulders up. And when you do that, and you do it for a long period of time, the second and third muscles don't activate because the first muscle overrides them because it's used to being in that uh, shoulders against your neck. And, uh, and it's amazing what uh, PT is doing for me and the exercises to just get back to normal. Now, for me, it's stress and tension. And I know it. So mm -hmm. that's all I can tell you. No, I, I think that's, I think it's helpful that somebody else is, is, is mentioning that this is how their stress has manifested. Mm -hmm. Dr. John, mm -hmm. you want to say something on this? Yeah. Do I have a live mic? Yes. 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 Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. I thought my mic cut out on me again. There's been uh, there's a tremendous.
Now it just cut out. Yeah, hey. it, just cut, it just cut out. We I think he was Christmas. going to say this is a tremendous thunderstorm going through Connecticut, and I'm hearing it too. Is that right, John? Yeah. Um, I guess it's worse now. Than anything? anything? Yes, we got you. There we go. Speak You're back. Quickly. Okay. Yes, there is a thunderstorm about to go on here. But just think of all the tremendous amount of hormonal and emotional stuff that's going on in Jay's brain and body right now. Testosterone levels dropping like a rock. Oh. Can't hear you, John. I think John, I think the, the problem is bandwidth. John, try. Oh, did we just lose John altogether? No, he's there. I see him. I see him. Try turning your mic, try turning your, your video off and see if we can hear you. Can we hear you? No, we still can't hear you. Oh, boy. I don't know what's going on with that microphone of yours, Dr. John. Um, I, I yeah, think I, the take. Go ahead. Who was that? That was Jay. It's Jay, I, Jay, I think that the, the take home here for me, what I'm hearing is that um, there's a lot of stress going on and some physical therapy wouldn't be amiss. And maybe you need to talk to the physical therapist about some relaxation techniques. I mean, is there is there anybody else in the group who wants to comment on this, who's experienced this? They, they, they you know, they've they've gotten all tensed up as a result of either the disease or the hormone therapy, and they they've had to relearn some some um, some relaxation techniques. Anyone? I can when say I, this. I, Let me say one thing. When I was on Lupron, I went through a phase where I was uh, crying for no particular reason. I'm not a big crier. I was crying, not just in movies, but I was crying for no reason. My wife would ask me what's going on. I had no idea. Um, Jim Meltzner, who was recently diagnosed, who came to the group, he was just telling me the other day, I didn't say anything about it. He said, you know, I'm crying a lot, and I don't know why. And I said, well, you know, that's what we do sometimes. So there's all kinds of changes, you know, you go through and the high anxiety could certainly be included in that, that group, as we know. And I just, that's my own experience. I didn't have a high anxiety, but I've had bad posture my whole life and I keep going to physical therapy for it and try to correct it. And that's a long habit I can't break, but the crying, you know, I stopped crying finally. Any, anyone else? On relaxation techniques for Jay? I'm doing Tai Chi and doing some <clears throat> weight bearing, very light weights. Um, tai, maybe... tai Chi is good, really good. And for me, the other thing is meditation. Uh huh. Good, good idea. Jay, what do you think it is? Do you think it's a stressful response or do you feel there's something physiologically going on with you that's not typically the way you respond to stress? I think it's something different than the way I normally respond to stress. Yeah, I kind of sense that the way you're presenting it. It, doesn't, it, doesn't, it sounds more physiologic than psychologic. I think usually people don't present themselves the way you're presenting themselves when they have a psychological problem. It's, you know, it sounds like you're really aware of something drastically changing in your body, and it may very well be, you know, something, that, you know, the, the garlics and everything else just hitting you hard, and it's just causing all kinds of, you know, discomfort inside of you, but I'm not sure it can be labeled as a stress-related response at this point. You know yourself better than any of us do, and you, you, I mean, I'm sure you've had enough situations in life that have been stressed. Uh, stressful to know how you respond. Does your body respond this way usually? I mean, you get muscular skeletal symptoms or 
how do you how do you deal with stress? No, I've never experienced this before. I mean, I may have tensed up, and it was just transient uh, due to a stressful situation. But this is almost a continuous, um, like a response to stress. But I'm not even in it. Well, I'm in a stressful situation, but um, I've gone through this before in 2020, and I didn't have this response. Uh, also, I wasn't on the drugs that I was on. Um, so it's probably the um, ADT drugs that are affecting my body more so. Uh, I, I did have Lupron then, and I just started Lupron now, but um, the side effects of the Lupron then and now are similar, but I didn't have this stress response or this physiologic physiological response and just reminds me of what i've seen patients who have something called tardive dyskinesia you know some certain medications where they get uncontrollable uncontrollable spasms and ticks in their body and it, although you're not on that kind of medicine medication i'm not familiar enough with the garrelics to know whether or not there are some bizarre side effects that could happen in people so I would have to, you know, defer to people who've experienced patients who've been on the garlics. I, I just haven't seen patients, you know, in my practice. The, the drug hasn't been around long enough for me to have seen it when I practiced, and I, I'm no longer doing that. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Well, I think I've got some avenues that I can uh, explore. Uh, as far as PT, meditation, and uh, maybe yeah. uh, getting some anxiety uh, medications. Yeah. Keep, keep us posted. Um, and um, I think if you are going to try the, the, the anxiety me um, medications, um, maybe try and separate these different things. So... Don't try and put them all together. Otherwise, you won't know whether it's the medication that's working or the PT or the, the meditation. But and and that can be an issue because you don't want to be taking medication, you know, if if it isn't doing anything for you and you're getting the result from something else. So, in planning it, and you know, I think I think it's a reasonable discussion to have with your GP or your oncologist. So. Okay. Great. All right, we're going to keep rolling and we're coming to Cliff. Hi, um, I'm currently being seen at uh, Walter Reed and uh, I had a uh, radiation treatment uh, March of 2022. I, I have an upcoming appointment with a, a new radiation oncologist. Now, is, is it normal? to keep a radiation oncologist on your on your care team continuously like that? I mean, does, has everybody else experienced that or is this something they just do at Walter Reed? So I'll, I'll, I'll give you what I know, but I think I'm gonna have to defer to somebody like Jim Marshall or, 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 um, or one of the, um, uh, or, or maybe Joel knows the answer to. My understanding is that they don't have any Janito urinary medical oncologists at Walter Reed. No. And that's a big, big problem. Yeah. So if your treatment right now is at Walter Reed, then you're gonna get be stuck with the radiation oncologist as your quarterback, which is yeah. not ideal. Right. And well, the reason I... why you the reason why you you continue to see um uh, this, this revolving door of radonks is because that's who's in charge of your care at Walter Reed. Okay. To be honest, Cliff, you need to um, use your uh, your Tricare or, or your um, your VA uh -huh. to get a medical oncologist running your care. That would be my response, Jim Marshall. Well, I, I do have um, an, an oncologist that comes over from NIH. He, he comes back and forth several days 
And right. uh, he's he's also in my care team. Yeah, but l let me just tell you from my experience, there is not a strong GU oncologist at NIH. Yeah, okay. Okay, there isn't. None of them, in my view, are worth their salt. Mm -hmm. Because if they were, and excuse me for saying this, but it just makes me so angry, we'd still have Herbie with us. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and uh, you know, they, 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 they may be great on research, but they're not, the, the, I would not recommend any, any GU medical oncologist in that group at NIH to anyone here. You need a GU medical oncologist. And you have, tri I, I, do you have TRICARE, Cliff? Oh, yes, absolutely, yeah. So if you have Tricare, you, you you have access to the best. You can go anywhere. Yeah, I I, I did speak to. Um, I had a referral to Channing Parlor, and um, my wife and I were discussing. Um, I, I go on Medicare um, later on this month because I, I turn sixty five, and um, I'll have Tricare for life and and Medicare, and uh, right. we were thinking about going there and and and. Uh, Channing Pollard has already, Dr. Pollard has already said she would, she would take me as a patient. So. Right. So, Ch yeah. you know, Ch I think Channing Pollard's good. I mean, we like her. Um, she's, she's convenient for you, uh -huh. um, which, which is, an, which is another good thing. Um, I, you know, I think, I think it's, it's, it's probably a good start in, in your area. Yeah. Jim, do you want to say something? Jim Marshall? Uh, no, actually, I uh, probably probably agree with that. Okay, because the folks there are good essentially at the beginning. They are extremely good. Okay, and about ninety percent of the guys have it removed. I mean, it's a mill there almost. Okay, but for the Long-term treatment, I haven't seen any there. Plus, also, uh, there is a turnover of the military uh, doctors to civilians. And so right. there's a proposed cut of essentially 18,000 military medical people uh, looming, okay? And so they are shorthanded. Gary, Gary Peters, you want to say something on this? I I don't know anything about the Walter Reed situation. Certainly, um, I think uh, Channing Paller is an excellent choice at Hopkins. And Hopkins is convenient to Cliff. Yes. Yep. Yep. So you know, I I think that 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 really what you want to be doing, and you can do it now. You don't have to wait till your Medicare comes in. Is shifting your care over and making um, Dr. Pala your quarterback. Okay. By the way, she did a. Dr. Paller did a, she knows us, she knows Ankan, she did a webinar for us. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much for that information. I will take it to heart. Okay, anything else? That's all. I, I really wanted to know, was, was anybody else carrying their, their uh, radiation oncologist full time, you know, in their, in their care? And um, I thought it was just odd because I don't really have much to just talk to the guy about. Yeah. yeah, no, it, it's, it's, it's largely, I mean, we, we see it, somebody like myself is more likely to see that where I was treated with stage three and the treatment was successful. Mm -hmm. And so Mac Roach was my last radiation oncologist. I never really had need for a GU medical oncologist. Um, but because I was a at the time, a Kaiser and a UCSF patient. It was my Kaiser doc that followed me. Okay. 
Um, but if, had I been at UCSF, it would have been Mac that, had, that, that would still be following me. But in your situation where the disease has progressed, you definitely need a, G, need a GU medonc. And you know, what bothers me is that Walter Reed doesn't have one and they have, and they don't make accommodation for that. And, yeah. and they, and they have, they see people. I mean, I, I seem to recall Joel went through that or something similar when we first were talking to him and, and we have to get these guys out of that situation and move them somewhere else. And it's just, we shouldn't it's not our job to do that it's walter reed's job to do that and they're not doing it yeah they're so, not doing it. um no all right we're going to um what is with david muslin and stay in touch with me for 12 hours oh, okay because you're a good guy david muslin and everybody wants wants to have you in their life that's what's going on there i'm reading the chat by the way i keep the chat open in case there's anything that needs attention there. All right. Anyone else have anything to say to Cliff other than Gary before we move on? Oh, we didn't ask Cliff what he had what he had on Friday. We know he didn't have meat. What did you have on Friday, Cliff? Uh, crab cake sandwich. Oh, that's right. Somebody said crab cake. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Okay. I can confirm that. I was <laughs> okay, watching Jay. We didn't ask Jimmy. Jimmy, what did you have on Friday? Oh, what I'm embarrassed to say. I had a salad with grilled chicken. And it I was a gigantic salad from, would you believe, wherever it came from. It was huge. I had a Greek salad with uh, grilled chicken and no dressing. I'm not that austere normally, but I did it that day. <laughs> <laughs> you were trying to trying to set the truth, no, 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 I gotta tell you the truth. After I was done, I felt so healthy. I stopped for a slice of pizza on my way back to my car. <laughs> Fact. Just a little oil and vinegar, maybe. No, that's why I needed the pizza. <laughs> okay. All right. Mm. We are moving on. Um, we've got Jim Barnes. Did you need time or not? I. Put a tick by your name, but I'm not sure if you needed it. That might have been my mistake. Are you still with us, Mr. Barnes? I think it was my mistake. I don't think he's still here. Um, so we've got Gary and Len, and we'll go to Gary first because Len's a good discussion and we can take a little bit more time. So, Gary, what is going on with you, sir? What did you have? You didn't tell us what you had on Friday. Come on. I also had a crab cake sandwich. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, Thank Rick. You. Anyway, I confess I had a big tuna sandwich and sweet potato fries. And they were. Oh, that's what I would have got. That's what I would have got, Captain. Okay. <laughs> All right. I think we know. I think we got everybody now. Um, Gary, what's what? What's on your mind? So uh, two things. Uh, I um, I had been on Prolia since I suffered that compression fracture uh, in my spine um, a little over a year ago. Um, but um, I'm still uh, breaking things. Uh, about six weeks ago, I broke my wrist, and now it turns out I have a um, a stress fracture in the front of my foot and the big toe. Um, so that's gonna hold me up for several weeks. Um, they want to put me in a boot, but boot, boots can cause a lot of other problems. I'm going to try to resist that. The, the question that I had was, um, although I'm, 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 I'm done with the abiraterone, um, I'm still trying to wean off the prednisone 
and I've got another six months of Lupron to take. Um, at that point, if I'm still undetectable after all the abiraterone and the Lupron, I would take a holiday and see what happens. But I've asked my medical oncologist before I stop treatment, I'd like to get some imaging that is not a PMSA, but would identify any cancer that is not um, manifesting PSA. And um, because I had a bone scan and an Axiomen scan uh, and an MRI at the time of my surgery uh, in 2020, and after I showed up with a, uh, a Gleason of nine and a residual PSA of 3.5, so I had those scans then, but I have never had any of those scans since then. And I'd like to get one um, before I get off the Lupron. And my oncologist says, as long as your PSA is undetectable, you do not need any updated imaging if you had cancer anywhere that was not reflecting PSA, you would be very sick. So he does not want to order any new imaging. So my question is, how important is it to get new imaging if you haven't had any for three years, but your PSA is undetectable. I'd like to respond to that. Len, Dr. John. Well, how are you feeling, Gary? You feeling pretty good? I've recently noticed um, increasing fatigue some of that may be because i'm trying to wean off the prednisone which can cause that but i've noticed that because there's a definite trend among medical oncologists talking about the fact that they do see something like 15 to 20 percent of patients who don't show PSA progression, but when they do, and they don't, they don't come up positive on a PSMA scan, but when they do other scans, like the technetium 99 bone scan, the typical traditional bone scan, uh, or an MRI or a CT, uh, that they do see that there are lesions. So it does happen. Um, That's why I'm, that's why I'm asking for this. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a reasonable request. Maybe a CT, an MRI, uh, maybe just a traditional bone scan. But um, it's been three years. That's quite a while. Talk to them about it anyway. Do we have... Um... The only site I could think of was the uh, Andrew Armstrong reference from that um, uh, further research into the arches data. Right, right. Thank you. Is I was trying to remember where it was. I appreciate you. I appreciate you uh, mentioning that. I mean, that's exactly what I would print out and and give it. But you know, your um, your doctor's not easy to work with. What can I say? And we know that. And right. uh, you know that. But right. uh, the best you can do is give it to him and, 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 and put it in writing that this is what you want. Put it in writing. 
in the portal. Okay, because because then, God forbid, something happened down the road. It's there in writing and present it to him with that Armstrong paper that stuff get, you know, some of these metastases get missed and, and show up later. And is there one scan better than the others for showing well, yes. up? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the, 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 you've had no scans. So if you were going to do one single stack scan, uh, if PSMA provided your PSMA AVID, but you know, PSMA together with a FDG scan should cover you. Even though the PSA is so low. Well, that's the problem. I mean, the you know the PSA, it's not the PSMA isn't going to show much until it starts to rise a little bit. So maybe what you can do is get an FDG scan, right. and then wait until your PS and 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 with the understanding that you want a PSMA scan when your when your PSA starts to rise and you get up to about one. That's what I was I was thinking FDG. Yeah. So you think that would be a good choice. Yeah, that's probably what I would ask for. We can't hear you, John. I'm sorry. Your microphone's cut out again. Um, Rick, uh, Rick, I have a okay. dissenting opinion there. I, I don't think FDG scan uh, would be appropriate for for uh, Gary because that is a uh, radioactive glucose. And the cancer has to be growing wild uh, for growing very fast for an FDG scan to pick up uh, lesions. So, I mean, that's why it's not really, it's usually not very useful in prostate cancer because most prostate cancers are very slow growing and the FDG doesn't get picked up very well. What so about what the, Axuma? What? What about no, Axuma? Axuma, Axuma, Axuma? you need a even higher PSA than for PSMA. It's not going to show with a low with a low PSA. So you know, what about a choline a C11 scan, Len? With, with, yeah, I don't yeah, know. Any, meta any metabolic scan like a C11 choline. You know, the, the choline is picked up if the cell is growing fast because it's incorporated into the cell membrane. Uh, Axiom actually might not be a bad idea because that's also a metabolic scan. It's a synthetic amino acid. So again, if a cancer cell is growing, it gobbles up amino acids to make proteins and build the cell, you know, divide and multiply. Yeah, um, we, we know we don't see anything on an Axiom scan under about 0.85. Yeah, typically you don't. Uh, but you know, we talk, what we're talking about here is an unusual case where cancer may be progressing without producing PSA. I mean, I guess the safest and simplest thing to ask for, most likely that they'll approve, would be a CT or an MRI scan. Okay. I have a Thank question. you, Rick. Uh, can I ask a quick question? I was listening sure. to a, a webinar today. Peter Atia, and he had a fellow from Vancouver uh, by the name of Raj, something, a very complicated name, but he does something called a diffusion weighted MRI scan. Are you familiar with that? No. Diffusion weighted MRI, very sophisticated. Uh, it's the only person in the world who does this. And he says uh, with prostate cancer, it's uh, sort of revolutionary where they can pick up things that um, you can't get on a PSMA accident or C11 scan. So it's just something um, new to me, and I just thought perhaps you uh, veterans have heard of this. It's uh, people go all the way to Vancouver from all over the world to have this kind of work done on themselves. Uh, so maybe we can all do a little research more on it and find out whether or not it has, you know, as much value as um, was uh, touted on this uh, uh, webinar that I was listening to this morning. Peter Antia. A very bright guy from Stanford has a uh, had a two-hour webinar on everything, all kinds of scans, uh, state-of-the-art scans, and they mentioned this at the very end. Diffusion-weighted MRI. 
and uh, out of Vancouver. And Dr. Raj, R-A-J, a long Indian name, and I couldn't, uh, can't remember quite. Would you be kind enough to write, put MRI diffusion scans into the chat window, please, there's a request or whatever it should be. Thanks, Dr. Jack. Sure. Um, Dr. John put an interesting comment in the chat window. Let, let's try your mic one more time. Can we hear you, Dr. John? No, we can't hear you. Okay, no. uh, he says, I tried the, um, the arches, the Armstrong, the Armstrong uh, article on his doc, um, who is, uh, what's his name at Yale, Petrolac, and he was one of the authors of the arches. He said he declined to order any scans until my PSA got at least to two, two, Point two, point two, to point two. So at point two, he was willing to do something, Gary P. Do you see that in the chat window? I'm sure you do, Gary. Yes. Yeah, it's interesting that Petrolife said no also. That That's, um, yeah, that's significant. <clears throat> All right. Well, look, I'm keeping an eye on the clock. Yeah, thank can you. We, can we move on? Len, I'd love to just highlight this conversation that you touched on at the beginning about gentler versus uh, harder exercise. Right. So is Ben still with us? Yes. But his, his microphone is off and his camera's off. But here, yeah, there he is. Okay. So just to give some context to what what I'm about to say, Ben, uh, I'm sure not everyone has seen your post about uh, your experience with uh, MSK's Integrated Medicine Group and uh, what they recommended. So if you want to start off with that, and then I'll take it. And and Ben, would you? Be kind enough to put your put the URL for that in the chat oh. window, please. Yeah. Um, so I I had been running, and I thought that um, uh, the prostate cancer was a good reason to run at least as hard as I had been. Um, but it was not it was not giving me the rewards that it had. You know, one of the reasons that you run is to feel the exhilaration for, or any kind of exercise is to feel the exhilaration. And I was getting zilch uh, from the running. Um, and and I, I couldn't understand it. And when I told um, when I told my medoc that I had this fatigue, she recommended I talk to the integrative medicine department at MSK. And she said, don't try so hard. Uh, your body needs to adjust to the to the ADT, you're, you're getting, by trying so hard, by working so hard, you're getting a cortisol stress response um, that is just making you fatigued. It's just messing you up. She says, you know, relax, take it easy, work with your body uh, till, it, till it adjusts to this new normal. And she promised me that I would be able to run again um, if I gave myself a chance to adjust. Um, and I was I was deeply skeptical and I was worried, um, but I tried it, and um, it certainly seemed it it seemed to help. It seemed you know by turning down the dial, it it, it restored me quite a bit more than I expected, uh, sufficiently to, to for me to to try at least a little bit of running again. So that was, and when you exercise, you always try to do a little harder. Than you think you can stand, and I was just doing it mindlessly. But dialing it back seemed to be the smart, uh, smart thing to do for me. Okay, so I just posted um, a link to a small study that was done in. Um, uh, it was actually women cancer survivors um, where they compared 
uh, well, just read right from here. The design was chosen to determine the comparative efficacy of two non-pharmacologic interventions with different physical demand intensities in reducing primary outcome measure of self-reported cancer fatigue. And the bottom line was uh, that uh, Qigong provides a gentle and lower intensity alternative to more strenuous exercise and, and nutrition. So there were two protocols that were followed uh, by half the women. And, um, you know, the kind of thing that Ben is talking about, the, the more strenuous type of uh, exertion, running or weightlifting, whatever. Uh, the, the more gentle approach of Qi Gong be just as effective in reducing cancer-related fatigue. Uh, and I had forgotten about that reference until I saw Ben's post. So, um, um, you know, I, I have that same problem right now. I, I think I've been pushing myself too hard. Well, I go to the, hold on I go a to second, the gym. Ben, ben, oh, ben, sorry. Hold on, yeah. hang, hold on one second. What did, they, what did they come out with? You didn't tell us. You just gave us the reference. What, what was the... What was the gentle versus exercise versus strenuous exercise? What were the results of that of of that study? Well, I yeah, I did give you the result. The results were that the uh, the the qigong, which was the, the you know the the mind body intervention, the more gentle form of exercise, was just as effective in reducing cancer related fatigue okay. as was aerobic strength training and aerobic exercise. Thank you. Sorry, I missed it. Sorry. Yeah. I'd like to say something, if I may. Yeah, Hold on a minute. No, sure. let let Len finish up what Please. you, oh, you well, were starting okay. to talk about yourself. Yeah. So I've been <clears throat> experiencing uh, shortness of breath, and you know I'm exploring different possible causes for that. You know, eliminating one at a time. Um, and that's a, still an ongoing process. But in any case, I thought, you know, some of the doctors said, well, it's probably uh, deconditioning due to periodic uh, hormone therapy. But I've been off of all hormone therapy for the last 18 months, and it hasn't improved at all. So I, um, I had stayed away from the gym for a while because of COVID, but I'm, I've been back now for the past couple of months. And I'm knocking myself out on the Stairmaster, which I hate because it's a real tough one for me anyway. <clears throat> and, you know, I can do like uh, maybe five minutes and then I'm breathing so heavy, I've got to pause, you know, kind of do uh, interval training because I just can't do more than five minutes. And now I'm wondering if um, maybe this is the wrong approach. Maybe as Ben mentioned, that. I'm inducing a cortisol stress response and it's not really helping. So yeah, that, that's about it. So go ahead, Jimmy. It's very interesting. And, um, you know, it, we all know that running is very strenuous. A Stairmaster, really strenuous exercise. We also know that ADT, I like to differentiate between cancer related fatigue per se, an ADT-related fatigue, which we all know pretty much what that is. And, and the, the fatigue is, is a result of the, uh, of the muscle wasting that we go through. So a lot of us who run and do aerobic exercise or are used to it and are habituated to it, we get on ADT and we keep doing that. But it's not only very difficult, but it's not, um, it's not uh, maintaining our muscles. So the thing is, you can weight train which has a reputation of being extremely strenuous, extremely difficult. But if you weight train uh, smartly, and if you weight train without, you know, without, again, without overdoing it, it is not as, as, uh, as, as stressful on the body as either running or a Stairmaster, or any really hardcore aerobic exercise. I do both, but I find that the, uh, the, the mixture of the two, and maybe, you know, again, not overdoing it, not necessarily doing a lot, Weight training does not have to be exhausting. It doesn't have to be heavy weights. But I think it's a really important part of getting older in general, regardless of, of our disease or not. It's a really important thing because we're getting older. As we get older, 
our decline in physical strength <laughs> is ongoing. And uh, Jack just mentioned Peter Atia. He has a great book out where he goes into this in depth. But I'm a big believer in both types of exercise and that we sometimes make the mistake on ADT of doing only cardiovascular work. I think it's an error. That's just my opinion. Hmm. Okay. Neil, Neil, Neil Sundstrom first, and then, um, and then David Muslin. Go ahead, Neil. Yeah. And, uh, Len, I took a couple of years off as well for, from the gym for COVID and, uh, you know, found, uh, different ways to exercise. Mostly I got on my bicycle, which is not my favorite thing in the world, but I, uh, you know, it's good for the, uh, cardio and, uh, and at least lower body. Um, but what I found, and I'm back at the gym now, uh, the last couple of months, because I just finished my radiation last Friday. Uh, and, uh, and so I've been making sure that I've been exercising. But what I th think I've found is that um, mixing up that gym with other forms of exercise so that you get a more well-rounded and in the gym, there's some weightlifting, but there's other things as well, and the and the uh, stairmaster stuff. But also, you know, just um, uh, um, go around the golf course. You know, walk for five or six miles on the golf course, or five or six miles in the in hiking, and then another day do something else: bicycle ride, and another day just take a walk. Uh, so mixing it up has really been really good for me, I think, in um, trying to get back into shape after, you know, so long out of uh, being in shape. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Good advice. Um, Mr. Muslin. You know, this is a real interesting conversation because uh, I've been dealing with some fatigue and I weight train twice a week for maybe 40 minutes and very isolated and I take it to the max and I'm worn out on those on those afternoons after on those workouts. If I take a bike ride for 12, 14, 15 miles, I mean, not killing myself, but a good, you know, uh, heart rate at 130 to 140, I'm exhausted. After on those days that I work out, on the days that I don't work out, I have a little more energy, and I wonder, you know, if uh, if there's some merit to this chigong, which I which is supposed to be really great workout, but I, you know, not familiar with it. I just know some other people that do it, so I wonder, combined with the, you know, for the length of time that I've been on mono derlutamide, I wonder if it's you know taking a toll on me. Jay, Jay, you want to say anything about Qigong? Because we know you're a guy that that, that has used it. Um, tai Chi um, comes from... Oh, Tai Chi, sorry. Yeah. Ta, yeah, it comes from Qigong. So Tai Chi uh, is doing the Qigong moves. Um, there's a warm-up um, where you actually move all of the muscles of your body uh, then you go through some kind of a, a routine and then you do a cool down. Um, and it's, I've been doing it for a few years now. Um, coincidentally, I don't know why, but today is the first day I did not need a nap. Um, I have no idea, you know, what, what I can attribute it to, but I think that the, uh, tai Chi also helps to take your mind away from what you're dealing with because you have to concentrate on what you're doing in the Tai Chi moves. Um, whether it has any effect on the fatigue, uh, for me, uh, I don't think so. But it, it, it makes me mentally feel good that I'm doing something. And uh, Len, there's a message in the chat window for you from Stan Friedman. Um, anybody else like to comment on this uh, this exercise? Um, uh, well, Rick, I'd, I'd like to add, and I'm sure Peter Kafka wouldn't mind me saying this, but um, 
he also had the same experience that Ben was talking about, where he was he was trying to work out, build up strength, and he he would tell me I had to on the way back from the gym I'd have to pull off on the road and try and like take a nap because I I felt like I was going to faint, pass out. So he got a an exercise trainer who said, "No, you're you're overdoing it." And he had Peter just take it easy, use less weight, less strenuous exercise. And Peter said he's, uh, as a result, he's feeling a lot better. Uh, but, but to answer, uh, who is that, uh, Stan? Uh, no, I am not on a beta blocker. So that, that's not a, a reason for my shortness of breath. Um, you know, it's, it's a very interesting conversation. And a couple of things come to my mind. I mean, the first is um, I, maybe to some extent it's a function of the time that you're on a uh, on on ADT um, or similar. And um, in my case, uh, I, I managed fine for 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 the two and a half three years that it was in my system um exercising strenuously every day but every everyone is different jimmy managed fine when he was on it for his year and a half but that doesn't mean it's good for everybody and i think the the um experience that that ben um wrote about in his in his blog post today um that we're discussing right now there's real benefits to some of the people that are I mean, sharing that experience, real benefits to some of the people that are in the group today, and I'm sure some of the people that are going to be listening. And you know, maybe it makes sense to, to, cut, to bring in some form of exercise trainer or uh, integrative medicine person um, and, and talk to them if you're having this if you are exercising and you are having this type of response, there's, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. We always say, um, if you're going to find an exercise trainer, make sure it's somebody with a cancer certification for reasons like this, because the people with a cancer certification are aware of this more so than just a regular exercise trainer. So your trainer may not say anything to you, but if it were a, if it were a cancer trainer or if it was somebody from an integrative medicine a group at a at an NCCN or a Center of Excellence hospital, you'd get the response that that, that Ben got, and of course we're we have a little bias because we're we're all we're all fans of the exercise program at Memorial Sloan Kettering and and uh, Donna Wilson who just retired, um, but um, you know these people know what they're talking about. Any any other anybody else want to contribute this before we we finish it up? Great discussion. I tried to get Ben to start it, but he wouldn't do it. But I'm so pleased that that Len picked up on it and that we were able to have the discussion. This is what I was hoping for. Okay. Just gotta say one more thing. Yes, sir. Men have a tendency to want to do too much. They have a tendency to remember what they used to do and to, and to want to push too hard. And I always talk about rest and cycles of, of, of rest and, and recuperation. It's hugely important stuff that's not talked about enough. But I still say, you got to lift. That's all I'm going to say. Well, I did, I did go to the gym earlier on, but I... You know, one thing I notice with my own exercise now more than before is it goes in huge waves, goes in huge waves. I mean, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I was having some incredible workouts. Last week, it was tough again. And then, you know, it, it just seems to cycle. Sometimes great, sometimes not so good. I think the biggest issue is whatever you do, stick with it. Even when it isn't feeling great, you've got to stick with it. And, 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 you know, be gentle on yourself when it isn't feeling, when you're not feeling great. All right. They're dropping off like flies. So before everybody goes, I want to wish you all a very happy um, 
I was going to say Thanksgiving, but that's my own joke, as the guys know. I, a very happy Independence Day. I always tell, I always say that you know the Brits celebrate um, July Fourth as Thanksgiving, because um, that's the day they got rid of you. So um, I didn't know that. <laughs> I'm just stuff. kidding. It's just my it's my. My my, uh, my 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 dry British humour. Um, so uh, we'll see you next week. I think Peter's going to be back in the uh, in the moderation seat, and uh, we'll all work with Dr. John to try and fix his microphone. Okay. <laughs> Goodbye, hey. everybody. Don't eat don't eat too many hamburgers tomorrow. Goodbye. Thanks, Rick.